where you can uh, what I, I'll take two more presentations, two more sets, and you can conclude the comments to Deputy Khan and the next two. So, Deputy Butler. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome the Minister and the staff here today. Um, a couple of things I was going to raise, they're already actually been raised, so I'm not going to go over them. There's no point. You, you, you have answered them. But just in relation to procurement, I just want to give you an example, and, and not, not just making it parish pump politics, but it's the one I know of. Um, I'm from a place in Portlaw County, Waterford. And when I was a member of the council last year, last May, the last week in May, we were shown plans to develop 12 houses in Port Law. Um, there was actually a house, um, Coolfin Woods is the area, and there's already 24 houses there. So we were shown the plans last May, just to give you this example. Um, the council already owned the land. It's another section that's going in behind. There are no, um, there are no objections. Um, the previous minister, um, Deputy Alan Kelly, sat there and he said there was no issue around the funding. And when I inquired again last week, I am told it's going to tender in October. So, as I said, the money is there, uh, the plans are drawn up, the council owned the land and there are no objections. So that's just to give you an idea around why something like this is Coolfin Woods in Portlaw County, Waterford. Why would it take that long? Um, it's frustrating from the point of view that we have the highest waiting list in the county and that, you know, when everything is in place, so that's just something that I think needs to be seriously addressed. Um, I also welcome the point that you said that you, you are engaging with the local, local authorities because I feel the local authorities have a huge role to play in this. And another issue, I'd like, I'd like your thoughts on this, Minister. It's something I've raised continuously for the past two years. Um, there's, there's huge issues with overcrowding in local authority houses and you know it's very hard to get a transfer and the local authorities in the last few years possibly the last 10 years, they have stopped putting extensions onto houses where there's room, except in medical instances. So, for example, I was dealing with a case of mother and four kids in a two-bed. Now, she's in her house 10 years, absolutely loved her house, is in very good condition, didn't want to move, but the council refused to put on um, another bedroom. Now, you could probably put on another bedroom for 25, 30,000, and it would mean that she, this particular person, would not be put onto a transfer list and would make the waiting list longer again. So I think that's something definitely could be looked at would speed up things. So that's the procurement and maybe the local authorities looking at extending their current stock. Um, another thing I would like to raise is uh, yeah, the cost of a house. We've been talking about that a lot in this committee. And I feel the fact that you know houses in the Dublin area, the greater Dublin area, um, they're, they're in around the 300,000 mark, not quite as much down the country. But the fact that between, I think it's either 36 or 38 per cent of the cost of building a house um, is revenue related, goes back to the state. I, I, I'm just wondering, you know, is there, is there some way we can look at that? Because 38 per cent, in my opinion, is a huge amount of money. Um, we, we also had um, Minister uh, for, for Finance, uh, Minister Noonan in, and we, we also discussed the issue of maybe reducing the VAT rate from 13.5% to 9%. Um, now, he said he was open to discussing that, but that he would like the... the um, he, 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 he would like that it would be passed on to the actual buyer, not just to the builder. And another point I just want to make, and it's just your thoughts on that as well, um, even though not everybody here might be in agreement with this, but I think we definitely have to encourage developers back, back into the market, because the local authorities can't deal with it all, and we needed developers back building again. You know, I think it's very, very important that that happens. And, and the last point I would like to make, having two children myself in third level education, a, Accommodation for third level um, students, like um, Deputy Cowan um, raised it briefly there. But I just think that's another issue because an awful lot of young professionals now are taking up uh, third level accommodation and it, 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 it's, it's choosing to be a real challenge. Thank you very much. Okay, um, and I'll take Deputy Coppinger as well at this stage. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, Minister, I, I do welcome the fact that you are now acknowledging this is an emergency. It's a word that we've found it difficult to get the last government to say, and I don't think it's helped in, you know, in, in stopping this homeless tsunami developing. So b before I ask you about the housing targets and how you see it being resolved, if it is an emergency, would you agree with me that the first thing we need to stop is more people becoming homeless? Because 
People think this couldn't get any worse, but actually it could get worse. Um, so you didn't mention, which I found very quite surprising, uh, in your document about preventing people becoming homeless and the issue of uh, the private rented sector. Now, in the programme for government on page 27, the gov it does say that there will be a, they'll review current regulatory regime for the private rented sector. Does that include consideration, real consideration, of the introduction of real rent controls? That would be the first thing. We, we know that there's been an increase in rent supplement. I'm not going to go there but I don't think it's enough. I don't think it's necessarily going to work. But now we need people who are struggling, uh, who aren't necessarily in receipt of rent supplement. We need rents to come down, actually, but at least let's stop them going up first. Would you agree? They need to be linked to the Consumer Price Index. Minister, this has been called for now by every single homeless agency that came in here in the last few weeks. Focus Ireland, Simon, the whole lot. Uh, all the NGOs are now calling for it, and you have to answer if you're willing to go there. Um, the, the second thing is, do you support security of tenure for every tenant in this country to, to prevent people becoming homeless, be they somebody who's been told by the, an, or, you know, an ordinary landlord that the property must be sold, which is now the biggest way that's been used to evict somebody to often jack up the rent rather than sell the property. In some cases it is to sell the property because the prices are increasing. Um, and what will you do in terms of legislation? Because I think that those two are two key pieces of emergency legislation that we need in this country. Just on the, the, your general philosophy now for resolving this housing uh, emergency, I'm uh, a bit disturbed that you keep invoking the term housing market. And you, you said you'd li like to get back to a normalised housing market again, and you talked about the housing market. Now, Peter McVerry, when he was in here, um, took issue with that. I take issue with it as well, because we shouldn't have a housing market, we should have a housing system. Uh, one of the reasons I think that we're in this sorry pass is because we allowed housing become a commodity for speculation rather than uh, seeking to house people. I'm still very unclear as to what level of public housing you're in favour of after your presentation today, because most of the reliance still seems to be on the private sector. Uh, you, you, you say, for example, there's enough <coughs> land zoned around Dublin, and I've brought this out in question to, the, to NAMA and to others. NAMA has enough land zoned residential land to house everyone on the housing waiting list in reality, but because of its brief, it can't do that. But uh, if there's enough land zoned already, planning isn't the problem. And would you agree with me that the private developers are holding off? They're hoarding land, they're holding back building until the prices go up again. And therefore, this thing about enticing them back into the market, like if they're on strike, you know, giving them more of the concessions that they're looking for. But you, you mentioned 25,000 in the document as being your housing target per year. Um, that would only deal, Minister, with new population growth. It wouldn't deal with everyone on the housing waiting list. But what type of units would those 25,000 be? How many of them will, what percentage do you think should be public housing of that 25,000 units? Like, for example, if it's 10%, to clear the housing waiting list would take 56 years. If it's 20%, it would take 38 years. And if it's 30%, it would take 18 years, if those are the figures that you're operating under. So the housing crisis would never really get resolved on those figures. Now, maybe you want more than that, but that's what you indicated in the presentation. Just also, you list PAR 5, NAMA, the NTMA, in a list there as being the things that the last government done that you back. Now, under the Park 5, last year half the houses that were built were one-off houses, so we got very little from Park 5. Um, and you reduced it, your government reduced it to 10%, so we're going to get even less than was previously the case. NAMA is, has a target of 20,000 new houses, but 2,000 of those will be social houses based on the Park 5 10%. Uh, the NTMA, you mentioned this Activate Capital, we had them in the other day. I'm a bit disturbed the way they're using, you know, 
Anglo Maple Town developers are getting big subsidies from this Activate Capital Fund. Former bankers are the head of this fund. But there is nothing emerging from these, this funding of 500 million from the taxpayer, because it was the pension reserve fund, to provide social housing. They're nothing more than 10%, as far as I can see. So um, I, I, I just want to answer this whole thing about the fiscal rules. It's been a, a key subject of, of debate here. We have 5.4 billion in the Irish Strategic Investment Fund. NAMA has about 2.4 billion left in its cash reserves now. If they had a different brief, if a political decision was taken to change their brief and make them build social and affordable housing, not all social housing, I'm talking about affordable housing, we could resolve the housing crisis. But when I put this to you, when I met you, you said quite rightly that if they changed NAMA's brief, it wouldn't be off balance sheet. So this has been the elusive model that we're all looking for. Now, we had three top civil servants in here the other day, and I asked them to show me an off-balance sheet model that worked anywhere in Europe. And there was a vague mention of something in France. Right? Everybody here heard it. There is, it's virtually impossible now to do anything off-balance sheet, Minister, if you want to comply with the EU rules, because they're redefining it all the time like PPPs and, and so on. So there's only two ways, I think, around it. Either we breach those rules to house, you know, people who need to be housed in this country, and we say to Europe, sorry, we can't keep by the rules, we have to house people. Or we have to raise commensurate revenue to pay for the housing that we build. And to do that, I would be very sceptical that that could be done based on the cost rental model, because I think you'd have to charge very high rents, but I remain to be convinced. I think we need to have a higher eligibility for social housing. to raise the, That would raise the rents then, because you'd be getting a higher rent off the tenant, based on the differential rent scheme, because their income would be higher, you get more rent in. Um, and I think the other thing is that you could look at, could you not, increasing tax on the wealth in this country that does exist. We, we've seen all the figures for how the top 250 have increased their wealth by 3% last year. Um, in your presentation, you say about public housing that nobody's arguing everything should be public housing. But I would argue that we need to redefine what public housing is. The term social housing, it seems to me, has become a term of stigma. Uh, a problematic term because it suggests that people have social problems <laughs> and they don't necessarily have social problems at all. And I think that we do need to define what we mean by public housing and I think one of the ways of doing that is to go back to, you say we can't go back to the mistakes of the past. Now every time we hear this, we, somebody invokes Ballymun or Knocknaheeny or somewhere. But what about Crumlin? What about all of the other you know, housing estates that were built by local authorities in this country through the decades that aren't, you know, huge areas of dep deprivation or problematic, uh, that loads of us were brought up in and, and reared in and, and were through. So I, I just think that we're also stigmatising social housing by just constantly invoking those examples. There's loads of good examples of public housing in this country. Um, not you, but th this has been an issue in the meeting. And, um, not, not saying you, but one of the things you mentioned is that you think all the public housing has to be mixed in with private housing. Now, this is a topic that we need to consider because how much are you talking about? Because if you just have 30 public houses in a private housing estate and another 40 here, to get, let's say, 100,000 off the waiting list, you need to build a million houses if it's, you know, if it's going to be, if 10% is going to be social housing or public housing, well then to get 100,000 families housed, you just can't do it. It'll have to be more than that. I don't see anything wrong with local authority house building if you have proper facilities in there, proper green spaces, shops, you know, properly planned schools and all of those things. The problem in particular was that a lot of the estates that were built People were left bereft, isolated, you know, out in eight miles from their, their base, etc. And it's just 
we'd need 3,000 estates of 30 to 40 houses if we're going to then solve the housing waiting list. There has to be a much bigger social housing than just the 10% or the 15% or you need to clarify what you think that would be. Just lastly on learning the lessons of the past, I don't have time to go into it, but what were those lessons, uh, Minister? Because I think that you're in danger of repeating some of them. In the programme for government, there's nine tax breaks for developers listed in the programme for government. Are you going to implement those nine tax breaks? Because all of those tax breaks that were done in the past, they were all done in the past, led to very wealthy people siphoning all of the wealth up at the top. All of the surveys would show that. And even though it increased housing supply, it didn't increase affordable housing. So you, you, you need to stop constantly saying increase supply of all types of housing because it has to be affordable housing. And it just seems to me that all of the uh, emphasis is still on just getting the builders to build without any reference to what would be affordable. And lastly, are you going to give funds to the local authorities? Like you're saying you want them to draw up plans. But my experience with my local authority is that they don't have the funds to build. Thank you, we so. give the Minister a chance. Just on one point of clarification, you mentioned in terms of the off-balance sheet models, uh, the NTMA indicated that the, the NAMA NARPS model could be replicated outside of NAMA as an off-balance sheet uh, project. I just want to clarify that point. Uh, Minister, there was a whole range of issues uh, from the previous uh, Deputy Coppinger uh, Deputy Butler, and to conclude with some of Deputy Cowan, yeah. so you have a range of issues. Yeah, no, quite a few questions there, um, but um, I just uh, on some of the issues. Um, first of all, in relation to, to local authority funding to build houses, um, I think there was uh, about 1.6 billion euros made available to local authorities for a three-year period. So there is a significant amount of capital available for local authorities currently to build. Uh, I know, f for example, in Cork City Council, it's about 124 million. For Cork County Council, just the two I happen to know because I live there, uh, it's um, it's about 80 million euros or so. Three years. Um, yeah, over that three-year period. So, so the, uh, and and there isn't significant amount of house building going on uh, nationally or in those particular areas. So, so there is money there. Uh, it's been used for various different things, um, mainly around acquisitions uh, of, uh, of of properties. Um, uh, to add to the to the social housing stock, which is, which of course is necessary as well. Um, just, uh, I mean, I, I think that um, uh, there needs to be an acceptance that that there's a role for private sector developers to increase supply as well as for local authorities. So, um, so the idea that we should look at no tax breaks because somehow, you know decisions that were made in the past around private developers uh, and the margins that they were making um, uh, caused all sorts of knock-on problems uh, and consequences. It uh, doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking at the moment at ways in which we can ensure that a private developer can make an acceptable margin and therefore progress developments and get on with it. Um, so, you know, undoubtedly here the, the um, uh, the solution to increasing supply lies across a whole series of bodies, both public and private, building and delivering um, homes for people. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not solely focusing in on one area or the other. What I will say is that there will be a big priority given to um, supporting local authorities and approved housing bodies um, acquiring and building um, homes. Uh, and so, you know, to make simplistic calculations around Part 5 being, being the only mechanism to deliver, uh, to reduce the, um, the waiting lists, one assumes that the people can never move off the waiting list, which I don't accept. Um, secondly, it also assumes that, um, that the only delivery mechanism is, is through private sector uh, Part 5 at the bare minimum of 10%, which isn't true either. Um, so there are lots of examples of, of developers who are currently looking at doing deals with uh, approved housing bodies or local authorities, um, uh, in some cases for 100% of the development. Um, so like this idea that, you know, that we read only 10% in, 10% is the minimum required. Uh, what we need in Part 5 is to ensure that every development in the country uh, is required to have at least 10% uh, social housing in terms of those developments. But of course we're going to go way beyond that. 
in, in loads of developments, and some of them, as I say, will be built by, by a private developer, and the entire development may well be, be given over in terms of an affordable housing scheme, or a rent-to-buy scheme, or, um, uh, uh, or, or social housing, or a mix uh, of a range of things. Um, and so that's why when I was asked about the glass bottle site, for example, that has the potential to build two and a half or three thousand housing units there, and somebody says, well, you know, are you only going to uh, get 10% of that for social housing? Sure, of course we're not. We're hoping to get way more than that in an in appropriate mix. Uh, and so what the Part 5 does is it guarantees a minimum. That's all. Um, but in many developments, um, it'll be in the developer's interest or in the local authority's interest to go way beyond that. And actually, I see uh, opportunities around improving um, uh, the cash flow and financing arrangements for private developers uh, to actually do a deal early with an approved housing body or, or, or with a local authority that may uh, allow a developer to get cash up front for, for delivering the social housing element of a, of a mixed development first in order to help finance the, um, the private development after that. Um, so I think it's, uh, um, you know, we need to look at the, the housing market in the context of public and private elements to it. Um, uh, Ruth raises the point in terms of trying to understand the kind of quantities that we're talking about in terms of social housing bill program, which is a, a fair enough question. The, 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 in terms of the, um, the social housing strategy that's there, um, currently there's an aspiration to provide 35,600 new units um, uh, between now and, uh, um, and 2020. Um, uh, <coughs> if you look at the breakdown of those figures in terms of you know, the anticipated delivery, um, you could say that about 22,000 of those, maybe 23 or 4,000 of those, would be new build. Um, um, but I mean, those figures aren't cast in stone, not by a long shot. Uh, and I think it, if we could go beyond that figure, considerably beyond that figure, well then, you know, we, we're looking at ways in which we can do that. So they were, that was a social housing strategy that was signed off on in 2014, uh, which uh, was quite a different period uh, in terms of financing in particular, in terms of the pressures that Ireland was under in terms of this on and off balance sheet argument. Um, uh, and as we move uh, uh, into a different space financially, um, uh, we may well find that, um, that we may be able to be more ambitious than that. But even with that, if we can build 22,000 social houses over the next five years, that would be significantly more than anything we've delivered for many, many years. Um, but, I, but as I say, I think we can, we can go beyond that. But just to give you a sense of, um, we haven't finalised those figures yet, but uh, um, uh, you asked for a sense of, uh, of where the, the current social housing strategy is. I think that would be a fair reflection. <laughs> um, in terms of, um, of, of NAMA, um, you know, I, I think it's important that um, while NAMA have the capacity to build a lot of houses, and they're going to, um, um, uh, we need to be careful that we don't turn NAMA into something that, that would create a lot more problems than are currently there. So if NAMA can deliver 20,000 houses,